Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three, the final day of Modern Sales Pro's April Virtual Summit, MSPU. Get your PhD in PipeJet. Since Tuesday, we've covered sales and marketing alignment, forecasting, the future of sales, building a sales engineering team, and data-driven prospecting. If this is your first session, and maybe you want to catch up on some of that, or if you want to relive the glory of the amazing content that we've put together, everything is available on MSP's YouTube channel. Check it out there. Before I go through today's agenda, I want to give a quick thank you to the sponsors of MSPU. And a special thank you to the teams at Zoom Info, Sales Loft, and Spiff. They're strategic sponsors of this week's summit. And also special congratulations to the team at Atrium. They had a great fundraising announcement yesterday. Really, really excited about what they're doing in the data-driven team management space. So check them out if you haven't. And as always, the team behind the scenes, without them and without you, none of this is possible. Elizabeth, Taylor, Hannah, Gina, and Nora, Thank you all for the long hours over the past weeks and months uh, helping make all of this possible. I look forward to celebrating with you much later on this evening. Now, interestingly, in a relay, the, the last person on the last leg is typically the strongest. As we enter the final leg of our summit, I think that's 100% true. This morning, we're gonna be diving into managing uh, the Gen Z SDR. This afternoon, we're gonna have some speed networking. And finally, Zoom Info's own Sean Dwyer is gonna take us home, talking through the evolution of the SDR team. Uh, with that, let's jump into this morning's panel and meet our panelists. And first and foremost, I'm gonna introduce, allow Brooke Langsfelder to introduce herself. Brooke, longtime MSP member, first time panelist. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so hi everyone, nice to meet you. I'm Brooke Langsfelder. I lead financial services partnerships at Ladder, but I spent five years leading sales development teams, um, largely enterprise and outbound focused sales development teams um, across multiple startups, um, including multiple teams across coasts. So I'm very familiar with the process of, you know, hiring and onboarding and building relationships and managing teams remotely. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Morrow. I'm actually at Cyber, which is my fourth startup, and I frequently refer to myself as a career SDR. Cyber is an IT and cybersecurity workforce development platform. What's super unique about Cyber is that we're solely an inbound response team. We get anywhere from 15 to 20,000 leads per week. So part of my challenge here has just been sorting all of that out. Our medium age here also at Cyber is 28. So just like Brooke, I have a lot of experience leading younger teams, and I can't wait to dive into that with you all today. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Cronick. I'm the Director of Sales Development at Iterable. I manage currently a team of outbound SDRs for both enterprise and for growth, if the growth space. I've been running sales teams since about 2005, both very big businesses, but lots of startups. And so I've seen the evolution over the years and certainly um, very, very well versed in how SDRs are experiencing the, the sales environment today. Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Buckley. I run global sales development for Twilio. Um, I am a huge lover of sales development. I've been in management for about, uh, geez, 12 years now, I think in sales dev. Um, Twilio, we're a customer engagement platform that allows developers to create digital experiences uh, via email, SMS, text, voice, and video. And I'm super excited to be chatting with you guys today. Oh, so I was also gonna say, we, uh, we have, sorry, Richard. <laughs> Uh, we have both sides. We do inbound and outbound. Um, our team's about uh, about 130 people or so. We actually split that 50-50 between inbound and outbound, uh, which is actually relatively new. Much like Ryan, we were all inbound and now are a split between the two. I, I still can't get over the staggering number of inbound leads that Ryan, is that is that Ryan why you're able to call in from Joe Rogan's studio because you get to get so many inbounds? 
It is. I was actually just in here dropping a few bars and I thought I would drop into this podcast to help you guys out. So appreciate it. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. So folks in, in the audience, as you can see, we've got decades of sales development leadership experience. We've got a, ver a variety of sales motions here. So please do take advantage of this. Just a couple housekeeping notes. We've got our amazing panelists for about the next 45, 50 minutes. Any questions you have that are on topic here, uh, please do throw those in the Q&A panel. In there, you can also upvote and respond to others' questions. And before like nine people ask, recording is going to be made available this evening. It'll be on the YouTube channel. Uh, the post-event summary page will go up on MSP probably probably Friday. Um, maybe, maybe if we're really lucky, it'll get up there today. But with that, panelists, are we ready to jump in? Everybody buckled up? All right, let's do it. Let's talk about this. Jamie, I, I'm going to start with you on this. Um, and let's just let the cat out of the bag. Like, is a Generation Z new hire... Is it that much different than folks that were around previously? Like, is it really? Yeah, it is. It definitely is. I mean, and, and, and anyone who doesn't treat it like that is, is really missing a real huge opportunity. I mean, you can go back and you can still talk about Tom Hopkins and Zig Ziglar, but if you're still professing that that's the way you're doing things, then you're really missing the uniqueness of what's going on today. Um, Gen Z has more data, more tools, more access, um, more relevancy in what's going on. They have more companies, more choice. Um, they can really choose their destiny. And it's important to them that they have purpose and that they have meaning. They don't just go to work for a job. They go to work because they love what they do. And that's definitely different than the experience that we used to have. Um, and so, and their, their customers expect more, you know, we, we have all of this data, they expect personalization, they expect customized messaging, they expect you to understand their businesses. And so there's a higher expectation for the people in the SDR world today, they're not sending this blast message out, they're really looking up and doing research and curating personalized messages. And so, yeah, Gen Z is different in all, all the amazing ways. And so it, it's a good thing that it's different, but it, it, it is definitely different. So uh, Brooke, I, I know that you've had a great experience managing some of these, uh, they're digital natives, right? And that makes, that makes the game a little bit different for them, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think they're kind of used to that always on um, constant engagement, which, um, you know, I guess that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Right now, it's certainly important to be comfortable with that. Um, I think they're also, you know, they've been impacted by COVID happening at this point in their lives, right? So um, the impact that has on their own personal sense of security, the security of their families, I think it makes them more motivated to kind of make a name for themselves and build their own sense of security. Um, and then certainly, I think, like, you know, Jamie mentioned, they're really mission driven. Um, it's really important for them to see the impact that their work is having on the company and that the impact that the company is having on the world. So I think tying back everything that they're doing, everything, um, everything that they want to do to, to the, imp the broader impact that that's having is really important. Uh, that that mission drivenness is certainly something that we've heard time and time again. And Ryan, I know that's that's a little bit different than when maybe you and I were starting out as uh, little little SDRs back in the day. Are you calling me old? No, I'm just saying that maybe it was different than it was five years ago. <laughs> five, like two years ago. Come on. Um, I would say I'm nodding my head to every single thing that Jamie and Brooke are saying, and I also would say so financially driven, but in a very different way than probably you or I were driven financially. Like I just wanted to make a ton of money and I was super money motivated. This is different. It's like, how do we make better data driven decisions about our money? One of my reps actually helped me set up my Robin hood account. I was like, I don't know what this is. I think I got a savings bond when I was born and my grandparents gave me stock in Buick. They're educated on money, beyond my wildest dreams, way beyond what I have ever done. And the other thing is, this is the first time I actually onboarded almost six people during COVID. And that was very, very challenging. But I got asked questions about the company, like what are our conscious uh, driven mission and walk me through your benefits and how were you guys involved in the community and things like that. I had never been asked anything like that. And those questions were never on my radar. And it's not only opened my mind up to being a more conscious company, but also really making sure that we are providing things back to the community as well. 
Yeah, that's actually, Ryan, that's a really interesting point. I mean, you get a lot of different questions and the companies really have to sell themselves much more to, to the, the potential employees that they're bringing on. It is actually interesting in, in you know, more than 10 years, I would say you hear less about um, the motivation being money, even though there is a motivation when you have to be able to pay for rent and all of those things. But there seems to be a reluctance to speak about that and maybe even some level of an embarrassment that there might be some interest in, in being money, money motivated. And I always think that's a little bit interesting because there's a big difference between being motivated by money and being consumed by money. And it's many times I find that you know, what drives you, what motivates you is probably one of the most important things to understand about um, your, your candidates that are coming through so that you can be able to push them in the appropriate way. And making sure that they're expressing that appropriately is incredibly important as well, because it is a motivator. It is something that's important, but it's not the most important thing. And just as Ryan said before, it was the most important thing when, when we were younger. And that's a huge shift. Um, it's really interesting to see that I think it's a, a an evolution of just the, the maturity in many ways of the reps that are now coming through. Uh, they just have much higher expectations and it's not just singularly focused. You said that much better than I did. <laughs> much, much better. I, I want to I wanna double click into that a little bit. So, I mean, yesterday we had Kevin KD Dorsey on and he was talking about how maybe in the future there's three comp plans that we have in sales, all commission, 50-50, 100% base. That's it. I kind of layer that in with some of the conversations that I've heard and had with Richard Harris, who's like, look, this, this new generation coming into the workforce dealt with the Great Recession. They came out of college during the, the rough times. Maybe they saw a parent lose a job. But maybe they've seen multiple parents lose jobs multiple times. So economic insecurity is very real. And his argument is that they're going to be more coin operated than any generation that we've ever seen. And I think there's more nuance to it. And we started to hit around it. But Brooke, I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on that out of the gate, because you've kind of come and seen this, uh, you know, kind of on the cusp as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely agree with what Patrick said. I think that there's some um, hesitance, hesitancy to to make it all about money. Um, I think that, you know, a, usually a strong SDR is, is interested in that, but it's not their only focus. Um, and I think that there's just a level of financial literacy with this generation that we haven't previously seen. Certainly at their age, I was much more cautious about this kind of thing. I felt like I didn't know enough to make these kind of decisions. Whereas you see now college students taking money, you know, they, they work in a job or they get gifted some money and they, they funnel that into their Robinhood account, right? They invest it. And um, so it just seems like there's a lot more um, of an understanding about these concepts and, and familiarity with these apps and that kind of thing from this generation. So I think it's just something more that they live and breathe more so than previous generations. I think it's important to note that like the SDR world is pretty new. I mean, it's this, it's really from this decade, it's been around for a long time, but it's really taken hold in the last like eight to 10 years. And it's become more and more important to businesses. And so with more businesses having this job available to them, they can decide like, and, and it really is very lucrative. Now we're, we're increasing the salaries, we're being very competitive, we know how important it is. So now they can worry about their salaries, and they can find that to be important, but they can choose which companies they want to go to. And so in addition to being able to make a good living starting as an SDR and learning the sales career, they can choose the values and the purpose that they're looking for and the company that's going to drive that. So um, there's a lot more options than they ever had to start out as an SDR than in the past. Oh, 100. Oh, you want to go ahead? Sorry, I was going to say, Jane, it's a really good point. I think you know, there's two sides to, to sales development, right? There's the building pipeline and there's building talent. And that side of things becomes so much more important is understanding that, you know, if I'm coming in as a, as a new potential candidate, I want to know that I'm on a path that's going to lead me to my ultimate goal. And in many cases, that's to become an account executive. And in many cases, it may not be, but um, you have to be able to prove out that you're invested in their development, not just their performance. And so I think, you know, there's still companies out there that I think have the approach that it's, you know, it's a sink or swim kind of scenario and, and we just weed you out and, you know, you're going to be in this role and you're probably not going to get promoted and that's just the way it is. But like you said, I got more options and why would I, why do I necessarily want to do that if I have a choice? And then you, the value piece comes into play as well. 
you know, like we have to, I mean, constantly I'm asked like, what is your most, you know, favorite value or most important value that you follow? Um, or, you know, why did you join the company that you joined and be able to, to express those things is, is so important, but that, that ability to demonstrate that you're, you know, committed to their development. And then you can prove that you've had other people find success in moving into those other roles becomes so much more important. So as sales dev organizations, the onboarding process, the training process, the coaching process, the interview process or preparations for the interview process to become an account executive are just so much more important. And if you're unable to demonstrate that, you're likely to lose the potential talent that's coming your way. They're just going to go to, you know, a number of these other companies that we have on the panel that do it right. So uh, it definitely puts the, the onus on us as leaders to make sure that program uh, demonstrates the growth of, uh, of an individual. Oh, I think... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say we're kind of this is this is great. And it actually sets us up for our kind of for our next point here, which is cool. We, we've got an understanding of what, we're, what we've got in the generation. But Ryan, I know you were about to hop in here. So let's just go with you. Like, how the hell do you actually set them up for success? Because it sounds a little bit different than maybe in the past where it was you go make 300 dials and come back and we'll give you a headset. Yep. And I felt like I was just lucky to have a job. So I was like, take whatever I can get. Now that's really, it's been a huge paradigm shift where it's really flipped on us. Like we're, where we're very much courting the individual contributor to come to our company. And like you said, go make 300 dials and figure it out. Kind of like, here's the deep end. You're going to learn how to swim. And if you don't, we're going to weed you out before I put any reps on the phone, they go through 80 hours of classroom training essentially. Cause I want to make sure that they feel as though they're set up for success. And something I frequently tell them is that they're onboarding and retaining them as an employee is paramount for me because then I have to start all over again. It takes me, you know, six to nine weeks to actually source for someone, then train them up for a few weeks, then ramp them. And it's like, no, I have you here. I want you to continue to invest in you. And I think when they feel as though that's a two-way street that they're being invested in, and I, I think it really empowers them to invest in the company. Um, Patrick said it where it was like, Hey, like, why would I join your company when I can go here and they're going to, you know, match my 401k. They're going to give me great benefits. They have an amazing onboarding program. And it, again, we're courting them and they're very, very much playing the field essentially. So it's leveled me up as a manager to again, make sure that onboarding goes smoothly, that I do set people up for success. And then once they are on the phones, how do I continue to retain them and train them and make sure that they feel again, empowered to continue to do their job. You, you said 80 hours, eight zero. Eight zero, oh, yeah. Okay. They go through just, a bunch of training, yeah. Just, just, just making sure I heard that number correctly because yeah. geez, that seems like, that seems like a, a hell of a lot there. Patrick, I know you started kind of chatting about this, but like how, how do you get them set up once you kind of get them in the door? Well, I think first, you know, the interview process is incredibly important. That needs to be smooth. That's your first, you know, entry into the process. And the people that you have on your interview panels and groups need to be able to demonstrate, you know, their success and the company's focus incredibly well. Um, next is that onboarding piece needs to be solid. And, and, you know, in the remote world, it's very difficult. I mean, I mean, I'm assuming it's the same for everybody else, but we have teams, team members that have never met another Tulian. I've never met anybody from, from my company before face-to-face. -face. And so that onboarding has kind of shifted into something a little bit different. And, you know, what we've actually found in the years that I've been at Twilio is you have to have a very specific onboarding process for sales dev. We had, a, a, like initially, we had a, a kind of apprenticeship type program when we were really small. It wasn't very scalable. So we brought in, you know, sales enablement team and they brought out an all sales program. And we saw the success of our reps and the onboarding uh, speed of our reps decline rapidly. And we found out is teaching people just about product, teaching people about the sell is not the same as teaching them about the experience they're going to have in sales dev. And especially if you're on the inbound side of things, you know, Ryan, you mentioned you're, you're on the inbound side, you've got to be able to, you know, you're answering the phone, you have to answer support questions, you need to know how to route people the right way. You're answering questions and following processes that no one else in the company really has to do. 
So it's incredibly important they understand what that experience is like. You know, being able to juggle, hey, when do I, you know, you know, uh, someone's coming in for a customer support issue, but I need to verify if it, it might be a, a product gap that they have, right? And it might actually be an opportunity for an upsell or a cross sell. But how far do I go before I say, you know what? I just need to service this customer and it doesn't matter about my commission. It doesn't matter about anything else, but creating a great experience. And flipping that switch is not necessarily easy for everybody. You know, if you teach somebody to be in a sales mindset and then ask them to be in a support mindset or a customer experience mindset, it's very different. And so you have to be able to coach around those specific experiences with examples, with people who are doing it right alongs in some way, shape or form. So they really understand how to flip that switch and make those changes in the way that's appropriate. There's the, the context switching part, especially is a lot to ask of folks that are remote now are generally a little bit junior in maybe in their career or in their professional career. Jamie, you know, you mentioned you've got kind of a large team and you've done a fair amount of hiring since the start of the pandemic. How do you get your new team members set up for success? And enablement's obviously an important part for anything that you specifically do as a manager to make sure that they're set up for success above and beyond some of the points that we've already hit on. I think connecting with people as humans is super important. Um, we know that they want a deeper level of connection. And so you want to understand who are these people, um, get to know who they are, create an environment where they can build trust because everything starts from trust all the way up. Um, and so you really want them, you want to get to know them as people. You want to let them know more than just what's available to their job. So, you know, you know, Patrick, you said it perfectly. Like we, we're not meeting people. We sometimes in some cases, they have never seen us face to face. I, I finally met someone recently and they were like, wow, you're really short. <laughs> <laughs> I know you only get to see me from like the elbows up, but, um, and so you, you want to get to know people in a different way. Um, what's great about iterable and, and, and some companies definitely have this is we have all these different affinity groups that are completely separate from your individual role and responsibility, but it gets you connected to the company at large. And so have events, have engagements that allow your people to engage with the company at large, the people that they can connect with so that they feel connected to more than just the roles and responsibilities. Of, of their day to day. Um, you know, then there's the fun stuff. You can have uh, right now socially distant events. So we had a, a puppy day at the park where we were sitting in a huge circle with our dogs, which was great. Um, we send swag, you know, swag's really fun, getting like things that keep you connected so that you're looking at the brand when you don't have, you know, the brand posters on your wall and the messaging about the values. But if you're going to have a connection with the people on your team, you have to involve them with more than just their day to day work. And that's a really important important way to stay connected with each individual. Obviously, enablement, you said, was important and making sure they have the training and Ryan, 80 hours, that is that is beast mode right there. But, but um, you want to connect with them as people and you want them to connect with the company on a deeper level than just their role. That's, I think that's it's certainly, we have to really think about the whole person here. And in Brooke, when you're bringing on new hires, how do you make sure that you're, you know, it's clear that you care about them and that they're more than just a capacity that's being added to a spreadsheet? Yeah, I think I, I think very similarly to Jamie, I think like connecting a lot, right? So that's like a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of phone calls, team events, just like kind of as frequent communication as possible, especially in the early stages, um, making it clear that you care about them as people and that they're, you know, part of the team. Um, I think being there when they need you is really important. It can feel like nerve wracking to onboard remotely. So um, letting them know, even if you can't answer a question right away that you're gonna get back to it just so that they feel um, like, you know, you're connected and, and you're there. Um, and then certainly being really warm and, and just being conscious of tone. I think it's really easy for that to get lost um, when you're remote, right? It's easy to, to send something quickly over Slack that kind of gets misinterpreted. So just being kind of like overly warm in your tone um, while things are remote. Um, and then, you know, bringing it back to the impact that they're having on the company. Um, and I really like to tell stories about um, like success stories. So other SDRs, 
who've done something successful and that's like had a broader impact on the company than just, you know, the scope of their job. Um, or, you know, here's someone else who wanted to be promoted and here's how they did it. They like took on projects from that team that they wanted to join and, and eventually they got promoted and they also helped the company more even in that process of kind of like feeling out the new team. So I think that's really helpful too, kind of painting that picture. Um, and then, of course, creating an onboarding process that embodies a mixture of knowledge and um, process and then certainly practice. Um, yeah, Ryan, that's that's really impressive. That's a, a lot, a, a lot of, um, you know, onboarding, but it's, but it's amazing because you want them to feel like they've already been doing the job by the time that they start doing the job. Brooke, you actually brought up a, a good point is, you know, kind of connecting with the person. Um, you know, my frontline management days, I was actually quite surprised of how much I was kind of a, a life coach at times. You know, when you think about a, a young sales professional who might be 22 years old, 23, first time working in an office environment, especially if it's a, a very corporate environment, it's fast moving, high paced, competitive. It's a lot. A lot of times these, you know, young reps are moving into a new city and are with roommates they've never met before. They're, they're learning a lot, they're meeting a lot of people and they're going through a lot of growth. I mean, if I look back, one of the things I loved about sales development is that I grew so much in that two year process, not only in terms of my skill set and my understanding of business, but personally, I mean, coming into your own and, and being responsible for yourself. And it's not easy, you know, it's a real tough part of life. And I think this group now that are going through kind of the, the lockdown challenges of COVID, you know, being in a, you know, stuck at home with roommates, maybe you don't get along with or whatever it may be, there's a lot of stress and, you know, family challenges that might, might come from people being sick. There is, there are opportunities where you do need to be something more than a manager and you need to give guidance and it can be difficult to do and not everybody's necessarily open to it, but some reps need it and providing your own personal experiences, putting them in contact with other people that may have similar experiences or have gone through similar things is real. And I think it's a, a key part of demonstrating your care for your employees and, and the importance that you put in them. It's not just during the eight or 10 hours or whatever it is that they're working, it's in their life because otherwise they bring it to the office one way or another and, and you want them to be healthy, but you want the team to be healthy too. And so that's a, that's a huge part of it. I think sometimes we miss um, when we're just talking about the numbers and pushing hard to hit quotas and get up to speed is, you know, these people are people going through amazing changes in life and uh, you have an opportunity to be a, a mentor. No, 100%. And I would, I would definitely choose you, Richard, as my life coach, coach based on this conversation today. But I was just going to say, it became super challenging to me because as you guys have noted, like 80 hours of classroom training, that's two solid weeks of training and you're being fed with a fire hose. So something that I did is I set up office hours because you can't just pop down to my office. You can't hop over to my cubicle and ask me a question. You just can't. So here's these dedicated two hours a week that I set up. You can hop in and out of the Zoom. The Zoom is open. And what it ended up being was like a get to know each other session. Let me understand how you work. Let me understand, you understand how I manage. And let's really, really make sure that we're all on the same page. I, I think that you, there's a vulnerability that you have to allow for that kind of wasn't there. Um, in the past, there was very much a wall. It was like, here's, like, here's the hierarchy. But if you really uh, adhere to servant leadership and you really feel good about the people that you're working with, every single person on my team has my cell phone number. I, you know, I've gone hiking with them. We've had barbecues. They've come to my house. Like, you need help? Come over. Like, let's sit down. Let's go through it. You have to be open to that as a leader in, with these kind of teams. And if you're not, you can't expect them to perform for you the way you the way you really want them to you have to be more connected and so being that a little bit vulnerable a little more open um, and a little less rigid definitely helps in this day and age i think there's there's a lot there's a lot on that and i think one other point that brooke mentioned you know briefly and it's kind of sits between these two the first point of like what's different and this point of making sure they're set up for success is that career path the the really having a clear understanding of what i need to do to get from point a to point b point C. And then you as the leader have to make sure that you're setting me up for success or selling me on why this is the right way to achieve that success. I think that's a, a hugely important point. I feel like we could spend forever on this topic, but there's a couple more good ones that I want to make sure that we get to. 
we, we hit on this a little bit more of the, the sort of the social consciousness and making sure that we're, um, you know, creating an environment where the team can feel really, really good. But I'd, I'd love for us to talk a little bit more about this, right? So we've kind of got, we talked about what's different, talked about how to set them up for success. But now as we think about how do we maintain like an inclusive, high morale environment, how do we team build, especially in this context of like, I didn't know Jamie was short or, uh, you know, Patrick could be eight feet tall. We'll never know because we don't get to meet him in person quite yet. Um, <clears throat> but Brooke, let's start with you on this one. What are some things that you've done that are uh, successful that you can share with the, the audience here? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm really impressed by the things my company now has done to keep people engaged. So I think those are great for any type of team. So like we've done um, a virtual petting zoo. We did Valentine's Day trivia. Yeah, the virtual petting zoo was like, you know, they're like holding up animals and uh, uh, everyone's asking questions. It was it was really cool. And um, and then we, we, we have a haiku competition tomorrow. We do monthly virtual game nights. So I think the, the, com the kind of common threads there that I think are really um, important are one, make it memorable and unique. Um, I think they wanna be able to share this with their friends, right? They wanna be proud of their company and the culture and the things the company does. And, and that extends into these team building events. And so being able to tell their friends about it is really important. Um, and then two, I think leading by example is super important. So one thing I've noticed about our events is our leadership team is always there. Um, you know, the co-founders are always there um, and they're not just there. They're not just there responding to emails and, and like being checked in, they're actually present and engaged and having conversations and and it really makes everyone feel I think included and, and like these events are really important and you know everyone's kind of on one level and part of one team and I, I think that's really really powerful. Yeah that's it's almost more demoralizing if the CEO is there like kicked back like nose in the phone not paying attention um, being there and dialed in I could see that meaning especially in a remote world like that that matters a whole heck of a lot. Patrick, I know you've done a lot with this and especially with such a large team. What are, what are some things that you're doing that you can share with the, the audience? Yeah, you know, it's I mean, very similar to what, what Brooke said. You know, some of these different activities, um, these different events, I've actually been really impressed with what some of my managers have done and the creativity they've brought to, to the table. But to some degree, I don't know if it necessarily matters what the event is, right? If it's a petting zoo, if it's an escape room, if it's a happy hour, if it's a you know, a pitch off or, or whatever, share something fun and personal about yourself. It's the opportunity to, to get away from the norm and do something different that is important. And whether it gives a laugh or chuckle or something that you learn, it's a bonding experience. And so I, I think that's the point. And, and the effort that you put forward um, to show that you're trying to do something a little bit more is incredibly important. So we've done things similar and my management teams have done things similar, like, you know, getting out of, together at a park, socially distanced, doing once again, like escape rooms, doing cooking classes, um, doing art projects. Um, we've got uh, our APAC team is just about to do a lamp building session where they, they've got all these pieces to build a lamp and everyone gets to build this lamp and do some kind of artistic stuff. Um, but I was even just really impressed yesterday uh, when we were doing our, our kind of just get together, it was just even some of the like fun questions and fun sales pitch, you know, competitions of, you know, taco versus burrito, you know, or you're, you're leveraging some of your, your sales skills. At the same time, it's just really fun and, and it gets this opportunity to, to just break things up. So that's been really important. Um, the last thing we've, we've done, I think that's been helpful is we just really push time off too is just getting the sense to, to, to get away from the desk and the companies that are, are starting to kind of mandate that a little bit more. Um, but interesting thing is the reps don't necessarily want to do it. Um, and so we've had to be crafty in how we appeal to the reps. They're afraid of being behind quotas and examples. We've made adjustments to quota, shifting quota, playing around with different things. So the reps have this chance to recharge. And I think that's also a, a real piece that, that feeds into um, you know, the, the morale on the team. Um, so those are some of the things that, that we've done. 
And I, I think one of the things too, I think there's a lot there. If, if, if you crack the code on how to get people to take time off successfully, especially at the leadership level, please, please do share. Um, but one of the things that you had mentioned, Patrick, that I thought was really interesting is how you're, how you're pulling SDRs into other conversations as well as a morale building tool. Can you share a little bit more about that? You shared it in the, in the prep session. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of just bringing them into to more conversations, and it, it, it can be a number of, of different things, right? I mean, you could be bringing them into um, different meetings at work, just showing them uh, a greater access to management. So that's encouraging. It could be, once again, um, sitting down with your rep and, and just spending personal time with them and not necessarily having an agenda. Uh, one of the, actually the, the best um, examples that I thought was really interesting is everyone had to put together a single slide that represented themselves and it had no instructions whatsoever. And the feedback from this was really interesting is, is they got to know people in ways they never knew. Once again, we've never sat down next to each other. And all of a sudden it started creating the sense of, of greater community and understanding of not only who they are, but the challenges they're facing. Um, some people might not be near family and can't go home to family. Some people might, you know, do better in, you know, uh, maybe more introverted. So things go really well, or maybe some people are extroverted. So those types of engagements, I think are, are incredibly important. So the conversation that you bring them into can really cross the spectrum, right? It can be personal. It can be bringing them into, into management meetings. It can be hey, I want you to present a little bit on this project that you've done is giving them a little greater sense of ownership, greater sense of, of accomplishment. Um, and I think those, those are some of the things that, that we've done. I'm not sure if I, I necessarily hit exactly what you're looking for, Richard. So if not- Yeah, then. no, no, I think, it's, I think it's a good, it's just a good example of how to, how to kind of elevate. And Jamie, I know you're, you're doing things like this too, because really making sure SDRs is seen is super, super important. Yeah, I mean, it, it's- it everything everyone said, these are all super important things. And, you know, we talked about the managers, number one, hire amazing managers that care about their teams um, because, it, you know, leaders, you want to lead by example, you want to care about everybody all the way up. Um, and so um, make sure that you have great leadership for them. Make sure that you're connecting with them one-to-one. -one. All the events are very fun and, and you want them to participate. I talked a little bit about the affinity groups that gets them seen by the organization beyond just the team that they're working on. Um, you create some spiff events where they work together instead of always individualized spiff events, group them together, make them work together, have them work together in different ways so that they can experience um, their in, experience their work a little bit differently than they do every day. Um, we do a prospecting telethon every Tuesday. And what that does is it pulls the entire sales organization together. So, you know, where you may not have had exposure, we're not in an office, we've got multiple locations. Um, every week, everybody gets to showcase their wins. And it gets to show the AE managers, the leadership, the AEs, like how strong they are at their individual role. Not only that, it shares best practices. So everybody learns and the whole ship rises. So um, it's a really great way to do exposure, but make it fun. And, you know, we play music and we make jokes and we've gotten some cameos in there, which is always exciting. I got corporate bro to come. We had a uh, uh, what's the woman from uh, from Tiger King? Carol Baskin was on there. So, you know, we try and keep it really, really fun so that they want to stay engaged, but we're also recognizing all the amazing work that they're doing. And so you want to find ways to engage. I mean, I've gone hiking with some of my folks. I've definitely gone to barbecues with them. And so you, you just want to engage with them one-to-one, -one, but you also want them to experience you and the company as a whole. And so finding different new creative ways to do that is always important. And, and anything that you you can do over and above is good. I know you mentioned, have you found the secret sauce to getting people to take time off? I could not be more grateful that my company has given us first Friday of every single month off since early last year. Um, it has been a game changer. And not only did we do that, but when we first started it, we started a balance channel where people would post pictures of them not doing work. Um, and we don't, we actually donated to charity based on how many pictures were in there and things like that. So we were saying, go do anything other than work right now, please, please log off. Please don't be online all the time. Zoom fatigue is a real thing. And so that, that worked really well. I will say first Friday off is gold. <laughs> so, That's, well, um, and, and, and you get out of the business of, you know, if I take a day off and Patrick doesn't, I'm, I'm behind, right? I, I, I lost a day on Patrick and I want to win because I'm competitive. I think that's a, that's a really clever idea. Um, 
yeah, that, that, that's an important piece is that feeling of, of being behind. And, and similar to Jamie, we across the board, the company kind of quote unquote mandates time off and the leadership team has had to be the one that got coached the most because uh, the concept is you, you can't send any emails, right? There can't be the sense that I'm going to be missing something. Um, and I think that's especially important for, for leaders who obviously have a high amount of email and, and, and things that they have to go through. Um, and so even our chief revenue officer has, has even said, okay, I got to get better at this and, and has done so. And it, it really helps, uh, you know, get rid of that sense of like, well, there's other people who are still working. And so I need to compete. Like you got to, you got to get away. Otherwise it doesn't work. Right. The whole point is to, to unplug and, you know, we're all hamsters at this point in time, uh, stuck in a, uh, stuck in a room, stuck in a house or whatever it is. So, uh, you got to change your, your environment. One of our, we have, we have a, we have four values, but two of one of them is growth mindsets. We want you to constantly be growing, but one of them is balance. And in our, in our, you know, our reviews, our biannual reviews, we make sure that we talk about the values. Are you living the values? Do you have balance? And if you don't, how can we give you more balance? Because you said it before, Patrick, if you are healthy and happy and feeling good, you're going to bring that same energy to work. And so you can't, overload people too much because they will never perform at their optimal performance. So you really want to give them someone a time to check out, to, to breathe, to feel healthy, separate from work, and then they can come in and bring their best self. I think, I think we've, we've covered a whole heck of a lot here. I actually want to get Ryan's perspective on this before we move on here, especially thinking about 80 hours of remote training that feels like the opposite of morale building maybe maybe that maybe that's just me but like that just feels like intense how do you how do you keep it going um well it's so I guess it doesn't seem as intense when you're immersed in it because it's like you know there's a lot of different things that are going on you're also meeting with senior leadership and you're also you know listening to you're jumping on demos and you're kind of riding in the sidecar and asking questions but I was gonna say making a million calls a day sometimes can become monotonous and it became even more monotonous during COVID when you changed into your daytime pajamas and then you changed into your nighttime pajamas. So every day I tried to institute something fun, like most creative standing desk, let's pick a twin day. Let's all put on a suit and tie today just to kind of change things up. And it was so funny to watch people walk into the day because it just kicked off your day in the most fun way. And the energy and the excitement was completely contagious that it spilled over into the entire team or excuse me, into the entire company. So then we started having challenges, recreating artwork out of trash, dress up like your favorite Tiger King character and make sure that you were bringing just a different level of positivity and fun. Like, Hey, we're not all together and I can't walk by your desk and give you a high five, but across channels, I can comment on Richard, who isn't necessarily on my team, he's dressed up and he looks hilarious as Joe Exotica or whatever, maybe it was, but it really forced us to branch out, not just from our team, but across the company. And we also put the onus on the individual contributor for coming up with these contests. So it wasn't like HR pulling out their hair constantly trying to get people engaged. If we listened to what you had to say and we instituted it immediately. That uh, I did leave my golden platinum wig um, off for this <laughs> session, so I, I apologize for it. Uh, but we, we've started to hit on this topic a little bit here. You know, we're talking about managing. Yeah, how do we keep morale high? I actually want to expand this topic a little bit. We've spent a lot of time talking about how we make sure our teams are set up for success. I want to flip this. How how the hell are you all staying sane? Sane enough to be that rock, that life coach, that counselor, that uh, bad idea, talker off the ledger, all of those things for your teams. And uh, Jamie, let's start with you on this one. Like, how are you staying uh, as sane as possible so you can be the best you can for your teams? You know, I, I'm not like, you know, the, the truth is to be vulnerable. Like I, there are days where I am losing my mind and that's okay. Like it's okay to not be okay every day and not hold it together all the time. And of course you wanna be the rock for your team, but if you're presenting this air of like, I'm just fine, everything's great. Um, they're gonna feel like that's who they have to present. And I, I'm an emotional leader, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not being okay sometimes. And they're gonna see that. And that's why I said having that level of vulnerability where you're okay saying, hey, this is where I'm at. 
empower you. Like make sure you oh keep your one-on-ones, never check out on those one-on-ones. Like make sure you're connecting with people because that's so important, but like make sure it's okay to take a breath, to not be okay, not be a hundred percent all the time, but to really give yourself time to recharge. Um, find the thing that makes you the most happy. For me, I love coaching. It's not like the primary goal. It's not my number one thing that I have to do. It's not my primary role and responsibility, but I love doing it. And so I make it a point to schedule that in my day, make it a point to find the thing that, that gives me the most energy that really gets me going part of my day, because I know there's going to be a list of meetings. There's going to be all kinds of stuff that I have to do. But if I don't find those things that really bring me joy and make me connected to the things that I do every day and why I love what I do, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> that's, that's just what's going to happen. And so you've got to be okay, not being okay. You've got to be okay be, being vulnerable. And you've got to remember what gets you up every single day and makes you excited about your job and make sure you put those into your day because it's easy for a week to get away from you without that and and then you're like oh and you're drained and you're done but uh, make sure you give that time and make sure you schedule some time throughout your day for yourself um, block that stuff off if you see your calendar in the beginning of the week and it's busy find those holes and block them off because someone's going to take them if you don't um, and you need that minute to recharge to get back um, i sit outside a lot whenever it's nice out i'll sit outside on my deck and just or on the in the back porch and just sit there and just take in the sun do my meeting from there um my ceo will tell you like go for a walk if you don't have to look at a computer while you're on a meeting take your headphones and go for a walk while you're doing it because it'll just give you a different perspective because sitting in the same spot all day long not in an office nobody around you it can really drain you and your reps feel the same way and so you want to express that this is okay this is what i'm doing i'm leading by example you can do this too and so that's kind of that's my way of doing it it's probably not perfect but it certainly has gotten me through the last year and a half if it, I think it's it's important the the part that Jamie you said at the beginning is so true right it's okay to not be okay I'm like we, there's no there's no manual for uh, management during a freaking pandemic when we're all locked inside so I think it's we're all learning on this um, Brooke what have you done here that's been effective for you and to keep your energy where it needs to be for your teams yeah I mean I I think there's a few different things that are important. One is like throughout the day, just kind of taking a, a pause and thinking about what you need at that exact time. If you find that you're hitting a wall, um, so for me, it's often a walk. Uh, you know, I take my dog to the park and that that often kind of like refreshes me. Um, but sometimes it's just having a cup of coffee or it's making food, you know, just taking kind of a pause when you need to and, and taking your mind off work for a few minutes is really important. And then, of course, like there's kind of the foundation for the rest of your life, which means do things that that make you feel kind of taken care of um, after work, too. Right. Like for me, that's yoga or running or, or a number of other things. And so if I'm not doing those things in, in the, the hours when I'm not working, then I don't feel like I can bring myself best self when I am working. Um, yeah. So I, I would say it's like, it's a during work, but it's also an after work um, thing. And I think during a pandemic, for sure, to me, the most important thing is getting outside. I think getting outside just feels like this huge sigh of relief. And it feels like um, like a real treat to get outside. And so <laughs> no matter what that is, even if it is, um, you know, going for a run or, or something, it just feels like, wow, I'm so lucky to be doing this right now. That's, and I think that's, that's doubly true for folks that maybe their kitchen is their office, is their kitchen, is their living room situation. Get, get out, get, get exercise. That never, ever hurts. Ryan, any, anything else that folks, anything else that you're doing or that you've done with your team that you found really, really helpful that you want to share? So I would say back to what Jamie said, it was like, how are you guys okay during the pandemic? And she was like, short answer, we're not. And I think that proved to be very true for me going into it. I had an extremely romanticized idea of what it was going to be like, like I get to be here with my husband and my two children, and this is going to be fantastic. And then I was like, literally 30 minutes later, I was like, I, what, who thought this was going to be okay. Personally, it forced me to realize how overscheduled I was. And then when I really dove into my work, I was supporting my team for eight hours. After I would put my kids to bed, I would hop back on and do my actual work at night. And then I was like, not only am I overscheduled in my personal life, I'm overscheduled at work. 
it forced me to take a giant step back and realize like, Hey, we have eight hours to get through this. You're going to do your best at supporting your team. You're going to do your best at getting through your work. And you're going to take a break at night because if you don't, you're going to get so burnt out and resentful towards not only the team, but your company. And when I had that conversation with my boss, um, he's a VP of sales. He was like, duh, like, what are you, like, what are you doing? Like, why would you even be doing that essentially? And so it was so refreshing to know that my company supported me on taking a step back and really separating having a personal life and having a professional life. So making sure those two things are separated, making sure that you are taking breaks to support yourself and your own well-being, that was paramount for me. And it was extremely eye-opening that I wasn't doing that before. Yeah, Ryan, I'm actually in the same same boat as you. Um, two kids, you know, and and I, I think it just you know, I share many of the same same thoughts around that. But something I would add on to that is my priorities have shifted significantly during COVID. Um, I was in a scenario where, you know, I left before my kids got up and I came home after they went to sleep or right when they're going to bed, which if you have kids is the worst possible part of the day. Um, and I realized how much I'm missing. And uh, so my priorities changed. So when, when my day's done, you know, I shut my laptop, I'm, I'm done. Uh, and obviously there's times where I've got something really important I got to do or, pre you know, prep for a meeting or presentation, but I have to give time to my family and I have to give time to my wife I have to give time to my kids. And to be honest, I'm not apologetic about it. Like that's my life. I work to have that life. Like my life is not to work. Like that's not the way I look at it. That's not my joy in life. My family is, and that life I have is the joy that I have in, in life. So um, work is a means to that end. And I have to reprioritize that. And it took a few arguments for us to get to that point. Um, even a few uh, world war, we, we think we have three world wars so far in my household. Um, and it's made us closer and it's made us better. And, and I'm happier. And as a result, I'm actually a better leader. I'm a better manager. I'm a better coach because of it, because I have better perspective. I'm more refreshed. Um, I'm generally happier. Um, but that doesn't make it easy. It mean it's easy. It friggin' sucks at times and it's incredibly distracting and it can be hard and um, it's not necessarily all sunshines and rainbows, but um, yeah, I'm not apologetic about it anymore. Like that's, that's, that's my time. And I, um, I love that. And like I said, I, I had this, I like geared up to have this very big conversation with my boss. Like I was scared to deliver it and his reaction couldn't have been any better. He was like, of course, like, why are you not already doing that? Like, this is so strange to me that you're bringing this request to me, of course, like, please make time for your family. Please make time for yourself, even more importantly. Well, we do this to ourselves, right? Right? Like we put this pressure on us that we have to be working all the time, that we have to be doing something. And if we're not, like we're derelict in our duties and like, that's total just bullshit. I'm just completely honest. And, uh, you know, even things like taking PTO, I mean, you know, a two week PTO, is really what you should be doing. I mean, I don't know about you, but it takes me three or four days to like get out of work mode. And now it's Thursday and I'm already thinking about, I have to go to work on, you know, Sunday, technically. Um, that's not, that's not healthy. So, you know, we, we're now on a, a two week summer vacation uh, because I've earned it and my family's earned it. Um, they have to deal with us. They have to deal with the commitments that we put forward and the efforts that we put forward and the stress that we bring back home because of the jobs that we do. Um, and that might be friends, that might be family, might be kids. It could be very different depending on who you are, but um, you earn those things. And um, if you don't take care of it, you know, if you, if you give, the company will take, it is a machine. As much as they care for you, the company is a machine and it will just gobble up those hours as much as it can, so. I almost didn't take time off. And someone said to me, we will all be here when you get back. <laughs> we will, everything that you see here will be here when you get back, like go. Um, and I, you're right. We always are hesitant to like take time off or do anything because you've got all these meetings and you get to reschedule them, but like, it will be fine. Everybody yeah. trust that everything that you've set up and everything that you've done, it will all be there when you get back and you will pick up right where you left off, but you'll come back stronger and more refreshed and do even better work than you did before. We have a, a PTO ninja on our Slack and it says like, Hey, you haven't taken any time off. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Um, and it sends us a report for our managers. Like, this is how much time they've taken off. And we say to them, like, hey, you haven't taken any time. Like, 
what can you take off your calendar this week or when can you take some time off because everybody needs it and we'll be okay and so encourage that it, it's good for your mental health and it's great for productivity that did not happen 10 years ago it didn't happen <laughs> five years ago and it didn't happen a year ago so that's a positive change from covid that i'll, I'll go with it yeah no, we have unlimited PTO. So typically that's like a blessing and a curse. Like people just don't either don't take it or they take away too much. And what I've seen is most people just don't take it when you only have, when you have unlimited. So you've got to kind of encourage people and be like, it's okay, go, you can go. It's all right. I was going to say, Jamie, you kind of nailed it with, it makes you a better employee essentially when you take time off, because if you're sitting in seat, you're doing it every single day. It's such a grind you're going to get diminishing returns out of me. I'm just here. I'm trying to get through to the weekend. But if I take a couple of days off, I come back refreshed, better attitude, excited. So you nailed it. Your, your reports feed off of that as well. If exactly. I'm off. If you're responding on weekends, if you're responding while you're on PTO, they're going to expect that's what you expect from them. Exactly. So, it's a bad game of follow the leader where we're is. all on Slack on our phones. And it's like, I just want to enjoy this sour beer at a beer garden right now. And I don't want to be on Slack. I don't know about the sour beer, but beer sounds I good. Know. It was a millennial. I, it was from the millennials. I or the Gen Z. <laughs> I don't like sour beer. <laughs> <laughs> sour beer. I thought it was all about sel seltzer. The non-alcoholic seltzers. Oh, and yeah. the, the ca California sober. Those are, those are all terms that I've learned since uh, this. I, I, by the way, I appreciate the vulnerability and transparency there on our last point. And I hate to do this, but we're at time just about here. Um, what I'd love to get is just one key takeaway for each of you to give our audience. We covered a whole heck of a lot of ground here. And uh, I'll give you all a second to think about that. And then Patrick, when you're ready, we're going to get started with you. So whenever you're ready, Patrick, share one key takeaway. Try to keep it about tweet length for our, for our audience here today. Uh, my one big takeaway, I think um, my the needs of me as a manager, expectations of me as a manager or leader change. And they're different from when I started and I have to be different and I don't always do it very well. And so I'm constantly trying to better myself to be a better leader to, to evolve with the times that are, are here. So um, I'm constantly, constantly trying to improve myself. Uh, Richard and the theme of evolution, or excuse me, Patrick and the theme of evolution, I feel like when I started out as an SDR, it was numbers, 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 numbers. If you didn't hit goal, that was it. And I started managing to a different, a different methodology. And it was like, I can't focus on the score of the game. I need to focus on the hard work that got us to that score. Even if we're not at goal, let's focus on everything else that happened and how we can iterate on that. And then maybe get to goal next month or whatever it is. But I had to remove myself from just solely focusing on, is it a win or is it a loss? Uh, I think for me, I, you know, I, I echo Patrick a little bit, like embrace, respect, like take in, learn from all the unique differences that happen each time gen a generation changes. And each time we experience something new, like a pandemic, which mean hopefully will never happen again, but we've all learned so much from it. So you really have to embrace the differences and the changes um, so that you can grow and learn and evolve. Um, I certainly don't want to become irrelevant and I know that nobody else does. And so you've got to pay attention and you've got to really just take in everything that you've got because that unique and that change is what's going to help your business and help you evolve as individuals and as a company. Yeah, and I would just, I, I kind of piggybacking off of, off of what Ryan said, um, I, I'm super process driven, so I always kind of like focused on that early on um, in leading teams. And what I found over time is that it's so much more important to connect authentically and show them how they're integral to the company's success than, than focusing on the numbers, right? That comes second. Um, and so I think that's more true than ever during a pandemic. <laughs> it's really important to, to like truly connect, have unscheduled um, phone calls just to, to catch up and see how people are doing and make them feel um, really supported. I really, really appreciate you all. I feel like there's another conversation for us to have just around like, how the hell are you staying sane? And we didn't even get to talk about 
well, how are we going to change and manage differently now that we're moving almost back to work or transitioning back into that? Uh, maybe we'll just, you know, do a sequel to this. But Patrick, Ryan, Jamie, Brooke, I really, really appreciate you taking some time today to join us, uh, to bring us home with the last panel discussion we have as part of MSP University, brought to you by all of these amazing sponsors. I'm Patrick, Ryan, Jamie, Brooke. You're incredibly busy. Thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to share these great insights with us on behalf of the team behind the scenes, everyone who attended live and those watching in the future on YouTube. Thank you so, so much for everything and stay safe and we'll talk to you soon. Take care everyone. Thanks again.